You all got your Bibles today? Good, because we're going to be ripping through some scriptures today. Today is a, uh, a Father's Day message, um, and we'll, we'll get to the title. But before we do that, I just want to take a few minutes to help the ladies out in the house. Because, you know, men, we have a lingo. We have a language that we speak, and most of the time the ladies don't always get what it is we're trying to say, do they? And, and so I, I found a good way to just kind of share a few phrases with the ladies to give them the interpretation of what it actually means, because men don't always say what they really mean, do we, guys? Right? Uh-huh. So when a man says, it would take too long for me to explain it to you, what he's really saying is, I have no idea how it works, but I'm not going to admit it. When a man says, honey, you need to take a break, you're working too hard, what he's actually meaning is, I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner, can you put it away for now? When a man says, that's interesting, dear, he really means, are you still talking? When a man says, can I help with dinner, what he's actually saying is, isn't dinner ready yet? When a man says, you know how bad my memory is. Anybody ever heard that one? He really means, I can remember how many points Larry Bird scored in the 1980 NBA Championship Series. I can remember every vehicle identification number on all of the vehicles I've ever owned. But yes, I forgot your birthday. Again. Right? When a man says, you know I could never love anyone else, what he may be saying, and I can't say he's actually saying this, but what he may be saying is, I'm used to the way that you communicate, yell, commu yell, communicate with me. And after hearing from my buddies, I really, I really think that I'm going to hang out with this one because it's, it's going pretty good. When a man says, you look terrific, what he actually means is, oh, please, please, don't try on one more outfit. We're going to be late. We've got to get going. Right? When a man says, that's not what I meant, he actually means, if something I said can be interpreted in two ways, and one of those ways makes you sad, makes you angry, makes you hungry, makes you upset, I actually meant the opposite one. That's what it says. Ladies, hopefully that helps you just a little bit today. Guys, sorry I sold you out. That's the way it works. All right? Today is Dad's Day. Today is celebrating men who are fathers in our lives. And that can be many different men in our lives. And that's a positive and fantastic thing. And I'm so thankful for through the years the many men who have been fathers in my lives. And I'm thankful for my dad, who is my hero. He's down here today, as always. And uh, he is, he's just always been so faithful. He and my mom were, were such a blessing in our lives as they raised us. But you know, there were other men in my life who were a part of my life, whether it were a youth pastor or whether it was a Royal Ranger commander or whether it was other men who grabbed me by the scruff of the neck in a moment when I shouldn't have been doing something and says, you need to knock it off, kid, right? All of those father type figures that really helped us to become and shaped us to become who we are. And so today we say thank you to those because they're truly important. While we, we want to acknowledge fathers, we do have to acknowledge that not everybody is a father. Or maybe you lost your father at an early age and it's a hard time for you today to do that. Or you're, maybe for some of you, your father was a horrible individual. And that is real and that is true. But we can all experience the love and the perfect love of our Heavenly Father, can't we? We can understand who he is. And you're like, how do I understand his love? It's, it's because it's written right here. This is his love letter to you. And when you read it, you can sense his love. You can feel his love. You can hear his love. Because he is love. I could never overemphasize to us today the, and any day the role, the importance of the role of being a father. But I found a survey that helped a little bit with that whole thought. And I want to share the survey results with this with you because I think it's truly important. According to that survey, um, if a child receives Christ as their personal Lord and Savior the, and is the first one in their family, there is a 3.5% probability that the rest of the family will come to know Christ. And that's nice, right? 
It also said in that survey that if the mother receives Christ first in that family, the probability of the rest of her household getting saved and coming to know Christ is 17%. Quite an increase. But if the father is saved first in the family, the probability of the rest of his family coming to know Christ is 93%. Fathers, you have such an impact in your families that you may not even realize the value of who you are and what you do. And I want to tell you that what you do and who you are is so important. We moved up here from Vallejo, spent 19 years in the Bay Area of California. And I can't tell you the amount of, of fatherless families that we worked with and fatherless teenagers that we were around and seeing the impacts of that in their lives. It is truly foundational when a father is involved in the life of their children. And we are so thankful for each and every father that does that and for each and every man who's willing to stand in the gap for others, right? Because it's really important. And if we were to look at, and we are going to look at God's word today, we're going to see that the goal of every believer, including every father, is to become like Christ. That should be what we try and strive to do. Are we perfect at it, guys? No, none of us are because we are human. But our goal should be to, to try and strive to be more like Christ. In fact, if you turn to Romans chapter 8 today, in verses 28 and 29, many of you know these scriptures well because you've memorized them in years gone by and you've You've used them to share Christ with others. And it says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance. And here's what I want you to see. He chose them to become like his son. He chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And today, my desire for you, today, my challenge for you, all of our men is to become fathers who imitate the son. You know, in a society that is filled with fathers who are imitating their sons, who, who just are, you know, running on the immature side, I want to challenge us to be fathers who imitate the son of God. Not the little children, but the Son of God Himself. And I want to I want to share with you the the ultimate goal of that, and that is to to take on the characteristics that He lived out before us. Take on some characteristics that were taught through how He lived His life that we as fathers can receive, as we as fathers can take on ourselves and begin to live out, even if it wasn't modeled before us, because we have a model before us in the Bible. I want to share with you seven characteristics. There are many, many more, but I want to share seven characteristics with you today uh, of, of Jesus that we as fathers can take on in our lives. All right? Uh, keep your Bibles open because we're going to be turning to a bunch of different scriptures, and, and that way you can just trace right along with us. If you're taking notes, you may just want to write the references down so you can go back to them later. But the first characteristic that I, I really want us to, to begin to see is that uh, dads, we need to be loving like Jesus. We need to be loving like Jesus. And, and that's, a, that's maybe difficult for some people. But the first characteristic of a father is to love like Christ loved us. You know, the definition of love is, remember last week I talked about it, God is love. He is the embodiment of love in our lives. He is love, and so we need to uh, take that on. We need to embrace that. John 15, 13 says this right here. Greater love has no one than this, that somebody lay down his life for his friends. That's the, that's the ultimate goal of love. You know, I've, I've heard someone say once that I, I love my family a lot. I, I, I die for my family. Uh, but yet they don't live their life as if they would die for their family. I know they would, but they don't like them a whole lot. You ever been there? Right? You know those moments. I love my family and I would die for them, but I don't like them a whole lot. And, and he's calling us to love them day in and day out in our lives. Jim and, we look at this and Jesus demonstrated his love for God and for others by really ultimately coming to this earth. The son of, very, of God himself left his throne in heaven, came down to be raised 
uh, right among us to die for us, to be the holy sacrifice of Christ, the holy sacrifice, the, the lamb who was pure, who could be our uh, covering for sin and raised from the dead. And he is that for us. Fathers, fathers, we want to embrace that kind of love that only comes from Christ. And you know, the thing that, that is, is tougher for guys, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, and that is to model love. You know, it's, it's hard for some guys to model love. And, and it, as we go through some of these characteristics, I believe that if we take on some of them, they will help us to be more loving in a lot of the ways that we act, in a lot of the ways that we do that. Because how many of you know there's always eyes watching you? There's little eyes that are learning from you on how you're willing to love your wife on how you're willing to love other individuals in your life. And their eyes are always looking, always searching, always trying to find it. God calls us to love like his son. Matthew 22, verses 36 and a few others after that says this here. Jesus was asked uh, right before the scripture, what is the greatest commandment? And many of us have heard this before. He says, what is the greatest commandment, teacher? And 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 he said to him, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. But then Jesus follows it up with the second. He says, the second is like it. He said, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments, all of the law of the prophets rests. And what he's saying is your neighbor, you know what, look to the person on your left. Look, look, wait left is that way, sorry. No, your left is my left. Look look one way, then look the other way. Those are your neighbors. Look at that person who's a few seats ahead of you. Maybe you don't really like them a lot, but God says you've got to love them. You've got to care about them. You've got to be willing to love on them in a way. And, And God wants us to love in the way that he loves. In the, um, we taught a marriage course last year in one of our small groups called Love and Respect. And in that, we learned about what's called a crazy cycle. Anybody remember the crazy cycle last year? Oh, oh yeah. (laughs) Crazy cycle is how it gets crazy in your marriage. Anybody ever have crazy moments in your marriage? Right? It happens. So the crazy cycle goes something like this. So at the top, it says, without love, your wife is going to react. And how is she going to react? She's going to react without respect. And when she reacts without respect, what's going to happen is he's going to react. And he's going to react without love. And this cycle just continues to roll through and roll through and roll through. And it's just amazing how often this happens. This crazy cycle just keeps on repeating where she's craving love and he is craving respect. And the two just cannot seem to get off of this crazy cycle. And since the fathers don't show the love to their wives, the way that they want to be loved, and the wife and the children then don't show respect to the fathers and and then stops the father from showing love to the wife, and pretty soon the whole thing is rolling and going crazy. And it's real in our lives, and we've got to learn, gentlemen, how to stop. Because, gentlemen, if you can show love, it ceases all of that. You've got to express love to your families, to your kids. You know, and, and we learned a lot of different things in that marriage course, and my wife and I, who've taught two or three or four different times over the years, learned that we were able to apply those same things to our boy children and our girl children, and how they work, because a girl is still looking for love no matter how old she is, and a boy is still looking to be respected no matter how old he is. The principles apply. Ladies, you and the kids, I can just encourage you, you'll only benefit when you meet your husband's deepest need and begin to show him the respect that that he really craves. It's in him. It's a part of him. And if you begin to do that, you'd be amazed at what happens. And I have to say that even when he's acting like a complete idiot, and how many wives say, yeah, that happens. It happens, right? My wife will raise her hand up. But it matters to the individual, no matter how goofy we may be acting at times. See, a father needs to be loving like Jesus. The second one I want to point out today is that, dads, we need to be humble like Jesus. We need to be humble like Jesus. One of the major 
sins that men struggle with in our lives is pride. Wouldn't you agree, gentlemen? Pride is a real tough one for a lot of us. Psalm 31.23 says, The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. He, He doesn't repay him well. Let me just say it. God hates pride. Peter, in his writings, uh, in 1 Peter 5, 5, he was writing to the Jewish exiles, those who had been expelled from Israel and were trying to live their lives for God outside of there, and those who were away. And he said in uh, 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. See, God is worthy of all praise. He's worthy of all glory. He's worthy of all honor. And we need to give him the rightful place in our lives, following the example of Christ, who himself was humble, who himself humbled himself before others uh, as a servant, coming and even to the point of, for him, it was to death. If we were to look over at Mark 10, 45, we would see where it says that even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, to humbly come and to do this. A great example, probably one of the greatest examples of humility, Christ lives this out so well, was at the Last Supper. You know, when when he and the disciples were gathered and they were meeting together for the Passover meal, which happened every year, but Jesus's this year was a little different for them because he was revealing himself to them, some things that they didn't know. One of the things that Jesus did in this Last Supper if we were to turn to John 13, 3 through 5, you would see this true act of humility where it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the the supper. In other words, he got up from the table and he laid aside his outer garments, taking on a towel and he wrapped it around himself taking on this, the job of a servant, taking on this, this, what would be considered the job of the lowest slave within a home would be there to wash the feet. Now imagine, if you will, those feet. You think about this, because they had just walked everywhere. They didn't have good orthopedic sneakers and, and socks and, and showers every day. So imagine, if you will, what it would be like to wash those feet. Yeah, it'd be pretty rough. It would be pretty rough. And that's why it would be the lowest slave within the household that was required to do that job. And yet here Jesus is, who is in charge of the Passover for all of his friends, who is taking on this role of the lowest slave. See, Jesus even knew these very men that he was going to be washing their feet. They were going to betray him. They were going to deny him. They were going to scatter in the darkest hour of his life. And yet, He's bending down and he's washing their dusty, crusty feet, serving them through humility. If we were to look over at the writings of Paul in chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, he says, Having this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a what? A servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in his human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, even to death on a cross. See, God's people need to push against the pride. Does that mean you don't feel good about yourself? No, that's not what we're talking about. But there comes that point of understanding service, understanding uh, humility, pushing aside the pride that can envelop you and and keep you from being who God really wants you to be and develop that humility that, that rises up within us. And it can only be achieved with the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It can only be brought in with His working in us because everything in us does not scream, humble ourselves, does it, guys? Fathers need to be humble like Jesus. The third one I want to show you, the third characteristic today I want to show you is, dads, we need to be compassionate like Jesus. Be compassionate like Jesus. Matthew 9, 36 says, When he saw the crowds, 
We're talking about Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and and they were helpless like like sheep without a shepherd. He saw that and it, it hurt his heart to see that. He had compassion on them in that. And compassion in, in today's society and men's lives is often seen as a weak emotion. To have compassion, a lot of guys think, well, I can't be that because i got to be tough. You know, compassion is something that some of the toughest people I know have felt. Men don't like to give the impression that they have a soft heart. They don't like that. But you know what? We need to have that. Jesus, he felt compassion towards the lost, and he even wept a few times. Many of you, uh, as kids, if you grew up in church, you memorized uh, this particular scripture because it was always good for a bonus point, you know, in the contest, the shortest verse. You know, memorize a scripture and you get a prize, right? So you go and you figure out what's the shortest verse. And, and so you look it up and you go to, uh, you go to Matthew, or excuse me, you go to uh, uh, John 11.35 and it's Jesus wept. Anybody memorize Jesus wept when you were a kid? Right? Why? Because it was easy. We, we know Jesus wept. We got that one down. Everybody does. But most of us don't know why Jesus was weeping, why he was crying. Jesus had just lost his friend Lazarus. He had just died. And Jesus was brokenhearted and hurting. And in that moment, in that moment, he began to feel that hurt. And he softened and he began to weep. We've got to be not afraid of a soft heart that can be compassionate. Psalms 103.13 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. As you do it, God does it. As you model it, God gives it. And even when you discipline your children, show them some compassion and love. And you're like, how do you do that? I remember hearing my dad say as, as we prepared to, shall we say, give me a spanking which I think only happened once in my life, I'm pretty sure. Why is this section laughing over here? That's not right. I remember hearing him say these words as he he was preparing for that. He says, this is going to hurt me more than it is you. Anybody's parents ever say that to you, right? You were probably like me screaming in your brain, don't do it to yourself. Don't do it to yourself, you know. Uh, It didn't work. We still got the spankings, didn't we? Be available to your children, though, in the moments of correction. Share in some of their disappointments and their joys. Play with your kids. Get down and be compassionate with them as they're younger. When they're older, take time for them. You can't always be a, no tears now, son. Come on, toughen up. There's time for tears. Be compassionate with the hurts. Walk them through it. Share with them. Love on them in the hard moments. Love on them. A father needs to be compassionate, just like Jesus was compassionate. Fourth one I want to share is that dads need to be self-controlled. Oh, now you're meddling, preacher. Self-control, self-control. It's very difficult for some of us. Every father needs to develop self-control. You notice I didn't say have, because it's not something that's natural for most of us. We have to develop something like that, right? Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city that has broken its walls down. It's open to all kinds of things to come in and attack. And that's the way it is in our lives. That's how a man is. When when we don't exercise self-control, other things can begin to filter into our lives because it's like a, a fortified wall that breaks down and things begin to come in. We don't have self-control, our defense against the attacks from Satan. And and how many of you know he wants to come at you, doesn't he? He wants to get a hold of you. He wants to get into your life and and deal with you. He wants to have you give in to some of your fleshly desires and and, and overtake your life. That's his desire. And that's where self-control fights against that. I mean, if you look at some of the instances in the Bible, just to point out a couple, you remember the story of Cain and Abel, right? And, And and. they, they had this moment where Cain didn't have or didn't exercise self-control and he ended up killing his brother, the first recorded murder in the Bible. Or you think about King David. You're thinking, well, yeah, those guys were early on. But what about King David? King David, who he knew what self-control was. He'd exercised it many times, but 
there was a moment when he decided not to exercise it. He's out on his porch overlooking some homes down below from the palace, and he sees a lovely lady by the name of Bathsheba and decides he needs to have her. So he calls and brings her, and they have a baby, and he ends up killing her husband to make it right, which I can't quite understand that one. But he didn't exercise self-control in that moment, did he? Ended up with adultery and murder in his family that affected him throughout his life. But we look at Jesus who had self-control. You remember the story of Jesus going out into the wilderness for 40 days and, and nights, right? And, and the enemy, Satan, was out there talking with him, trying to tempt him with pride, trying to tempt him with authority, trying to tempt him with, with, uh, with food when he was fasting. And, and Jesus held on to his self-control and exercised it all the way through those 40 days and nights and didn't give in to any of the temptations that were coming at him. And that's in Luke chapter 4, if you're wanting to write that down or read about that later. But Luke 4 also illustrates uh, to us that we can defeat the temptations through the enemy of the enemy through fasting and through prayer and, and through the idea that the Holy Spirit who is, is within us gives us strength to rise up against those things through the Word of God, which gives us God's words, the things that speak into our lives. Let me just tell you, gentlemen, if you're not reading, how in the world will you know what God has for you and what he wants for you? This is so critical in our lives as fathers. Are you reading the Bible? Even more so, are you taking time and reading some of these Bible stories to your kids? Are you speaking into their lives the word of God? We need to exercise self-control. In fact, Galatians 5.23 describes the word self-control, as one of the fruit of the spirits. There are many fruits of the spirit that they list, but one of them is self-control. Fathers, we need to develop self-control. The next one will be dads. We need to be gentle like Jesus. You know, we're, we're taught to be big and rough and gruff, but sometimes we've got to be gentle. Many men think that meekness is a sign of weakness, and it's not. Angry, macho men, uh, are, are projected as real men in the world, but the reality is, is that's not what a real man looks like. Gentleness is something that's Christ-like. And there's nothing wrong with being uh, a gentle man. Some of the biggest men I have known learned to be gentle, and I love that. There's so much in it. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says this, Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, and learn from me. He says, For I am what? Gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn from me, Jesus says. I am gentle. In Matthew 5, 21, it says, excuse me, Matthew 21, 5, uh, Matthew actually quotes a scripture out of the Old Testament from Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah wrote in 9, 9, he wrote, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. This is a foretelling of Jesus coming to, to save the world that the prophet Zechariah received from the Lord. And if you remember right from when we spoke a, a couple of months back uh, of what it means when a king comes riding on a donkey, it means that a king is coming in peace. You remember that message? We talked about how a, a king who rides in on a donkey is coming in peace. A king who rides in on a horse is coming in to have war. And, and here we're describing Zechariah was describing Jesus coming as a gentle and humble individual mounted on a donkey, a, a, donkey, a, a mission of peace to bring peace to the world. See, guys, developing the quality of gentleness in our lives is so important as a leader in your homes. It's so important in, in, as a leader in your businesses. It, it's important in, in so many areas. If you're, if you're on a team or if you're involved in some things, that gentleness can be such an encouraging thing. In Galatians 5.23, as I mentioned a second ago, lists it as a fruit of the Spirit as well. And so you're okay, okay, I don't know what the fruit of the Spirit are. What are you talking about? If, if you have an orange tree, what fruit does it produce? Thank you. If you have an apple tree, what fruit does an apple tree produce? Great. If you have a cherry tree, what, what fruit does cherry tree produce? Okay, so he is illustrating that we, as believers in Jesus Christ, who have the Holy Spirit within us, if that is, if we're like a tree, it says the fruit of the Spirit 
that's within us should look like this. And it lists a number of things, including gentleness and including self-control, saying that's what we as believers should be having come out of our lives when we are faithfully walking with God. And as leaders in your homes, I really want to encourage you, don't drive your families harshly. Lead them gently. A father needs to be gentle. Another one I want to mention is that dads discipline like Jesus. Some of the dads are like, yes, finally we're there. Just don't spare the rod, spoil the child, right? Yes. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Jesus is not only about love and compassion and gentleness. He also wants firm discipline. He, he believes that's true. Fathers, you got to be gentle when you're disciplining your kids. you got to find that balance with firmness and gentleness in it. One thing that I worked hard at trying to do, and I wasn't always successful, but I really wanted to try, and I tried hard to be that one who would never discipline when I was angry. Because when I discipline when I'm angry, it's, it's a much scarier moment, and there's no compassion in it whatsoever. And so uh, I, I worked hard at trying to send my kids to go to their room and then bring myself back down to the place I needed so that I could discipline them with a heart of compassion that says they weren't hurting me, Kevin. They were breaking a rule, and it hurt my heart that they were breaking a rule, and so I go up with a heart that's ready to help them to understand what they really did rather than being mad that they broke a rule. So I really want to encourage you guys, gentleness, discipline in all of that is so important that it can wrap together with love rather than with wrath and anger in your, in your discipline. When Jesus predicts his death and his suffering, Peter was rebuked by Jesus. Peter came after him, and I mean, excuse me, Jesus, uh, Peter, he, he said, far be it from you, Lord. Peter's talking to him. This, this will never happen to you. You won't be crucified. I won't let it happen. Peter's a big, rough and tumble guy, right? It ain't going to happen, God. Right? But Jesus then wanted to, to get him in line, and he rebuked him with some strong words, and he told him, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, he said. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but you're setting your mind on the things of man. You don't understand what you're doing. Step back. Let go. I love the words that we find in Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. I told you I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today, so we're, we're moving here, we're moving. Which was later quoted, though, in Hebrews chapter 12. Laid, he mentioned that, and this is what he wrote in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. It says, my son, he said, don't despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves or corrects him who he loves, just like a father, the son whom he delights. Correction is important. Discipline is important, but I want to challenge you to discipline from gentleness, compassion, and love, not from anger and wrath. Let me just say that if you love your kids, you'll discipline them, correct them, and, and do it with a gentle spirit because, fathers, we need to discipline like gentle, like Jesus did. The last one I want to share with you today is this. Dads, we need to be prayerful like Jesus. Jesus did a lot of praying. He did a lot of praying. We need to be willing to pray. And you're like, oh, I'm not good at that. That's okay. You weren't good at everything else you do, but it took time, didn't it? You learned to ride a bike. Let me just, some of you, did you just climb on the bike and instantly were riding? No, it took time. You know, for some of you, you're still learning how to navigate the internet on the computer, right? It takes time. It's something, prayer is the same. You can learn, you can grow in it as you continue to walk through it and do prayer. Jesus was a man of prayer. I, I ran across a book, uh, excuse me, no, let me take that back, in a book that I, I, I had read uh, on spiritual leadership by uh, J. Oswald Sanders. He writes about Jesus' prayer life. And I like what he says. Check this out. I'm going to have it put up here. It says, if uh, anyone, and he's talking about Jesus, if anyone could have a sustained prayer with life without prayer, it would have been the very Son of God, don't you think? Right? He himself. If prayer is silly or unnecessary, Jesus would not have wasted his time at it. 
But wait, prayer was the dominant feature of his life and a reoccurring part of his teaching. If anybody could have sustained a life and healthy without prayer, it should have been the Son of God, shouldn't it? And yet, we often hear, like in Luke 5.16, it says Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He still needed to get away to rejuvenate himself, to communicate with his Father. See, Father, there's a lot of times we get so busy looking to provide our physical needs of our family. We, we get busy looking to provide the, the money to, to feed and all of that. And don't get me wrong, those are important. But, fathers, we need to pray for your children. You need to pray with your children. Don't be afraid to lead your family in prayer, guys. Don't be afraid to read your Bible with your family. It's so important to them that we be the spiritual leader that God has called each of us to be in our homes. That's what he desires for us to do. That's what he wants us to do, is to put ourselves into his hands and trust him. And the only way you can do that is communicating with God, and that happens in two ways, and that's praying where you can talk with God and the other is in the Word, where He can talk to you about who He would like for you to be. It's found within the pages of this book right here. Because He loves you as a father loves a son. He loves you and He wants what's best for you and for your kids. And let me just say, gentlemen, that you are setting the course for the future of your family. What you do with your kids today will have generational effects in their lives. Because what they see you doing, they will do with their children. What they see you emulating, they will be doing with their children. For generations to come, it will continue to be passed down and passed down. And that's critical. I was reminded of the, the value of passing things down just this week. Um, on Thursday, we had a homegoing celebration for, for Shar Miller, who passed away. And in talking with her daughter in preparation for this, Julie, one of the things Julie mentioned to me was they wanted the song, You Are My Sunshine, to be played at the funeral. Kind of a silly little song. And many of you probably sang it to your kids um, in their lives. And I asked her why, and she says, well, it was a song that mom sang to me and my siblings. And it's a song that me and my siblings all sang to our children growing up. And as we sit outside their rooms or we're in the living room, we hear our children singing to those grandchildren. Generationally, it's something so simple, and yet it carried down. Never underestimate the power of your influence in your family's lives. What do you want them to carry with them? What do you want them to have impacting in their lives? So let me wrap it up with this. Just one simple question. Do you want to know who the most successful father is? It's the father who imitates the son. That's the one who's most successful. Let's pray. God, today as we are here and we honor our dads, we honor the men in our lives who've influenced us. And that may be coaches, that may be our fathers, it may be our grandfathers, it may be other men in our lives, Lord, we honor them today, definitely. And we thank you for those influences in our lives that have been strong and positive. But Lord, I also know that not everybody had that. And so today we look to your son as an influence in our life of a father and what we can do moving forward with that. So today, God, I just pray that you would touch and encourage us. And if, with your heads bowed today, I just want to, simple question for you guys because I know that not everybody had a perfect childhood. I know that not everybody had perfect examples and 
and uh, uh, fathers in their lives. And you may say, Pastor, you know what? I, and maybe you did, and you're just not living it out. You say, Pastor, can, can you just pray for me today? I'm just, I, I, I'm not looking to do anything other than just acknowledge you today. Can you just pray for me? I'm struggling in the area, some of those areas, and I really would love a little bit of prayer encouragement over me today in some areas that I need to do better at. And if that's you, just where you're sitting today, if you wouldn't mind, just raise a hand up for a moment. Let me see it so I know who to be praying for. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Is there others? Thank you. Yeah, I see ladies' hands going up too. That's awesome. Thank you. Anyone else would say, you know what, I need to change some of those things in me. That Can you just pray for me, Pastor? Father, you see those hands, you understand those hearts, and you decide to understand the desire within them to want to be better, to want to be the man that you want them to be, God, to take on some of these characteristics that maybe have been difficult for them. Maybe, Lord, these characteristics that have been really uh, never modeled it before them in their lives and they're not sure how to do that. I pray that you, God, would direct them, that you would guide them, that you would give them some examples of those kind of characteristics that can help them to be the men of God that you desire for them to be in their families, for their children and their wives. Touch them today, I pray, God.